Well, everybody, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about interactive VR characters um, from you. I'm uh, from a new startup called Limitless. Um, we've just coming out of stealth. Uh, we're a team of ex-Pixar, ex-Bungie devs. We worked on a bunch of Pixar films and four Bungie games. Uh, I was a character lead at Pixar for 11 years, worked on characters such as Mater, um, Kevin from Up, Jellyfish on Nemo, and then was at Bungie as a character and cinematics lead uh, working on Destiny. And so when we put our team together and when we started thinking about VR, we asked ourselves, what are the inspirations that we should be drawing for storytelling in VR? Um, a lot of people were looking at film, and film was a great inspiration for this. 100 plus years of visual storytelling, and there's a lot of lessons to be drawn from film, and we haven't even um, gotten all of them yet. Uh, a lot of people also look at video games, which is also really great. You know, just a very natural fit for VR. Uh, putting, video games are very good at putting the, the player into the space, very good at directing uh, their attention without controlling the camera, because in a 3D video game you can look anywhere you want. And a lot of great gameplay lessons that are really good um, for VR. So we love that as well. Then there's also theater. This is something that also has a lot of great lessons in terms of storytelling, presence, stage, telling a story across um, you know, in one spot, even though you change sets and go to different times. Um, and it's something that I think is a little underappreciated, especially because, because it's also a great medium that uh, helps us tell a story without directing the player's eye quite as um, directly as film does. But with all of these, we felt there was something missing. We were missing the original inspiration from VR. Um, for us, that was the holodeck, the Star Trek holodeck. It wasn't putting us into a video game or a movie or a play. It was doing something else. You know, the holodeck is about recreating real life. And real life is a really great uh, place to start for us with VR. Then we asked ourselves, what's interesting about uh, real life in VR? You know, it's not knobs and you know, physical things. It's not screens. The thing that's really exciting to us about real life is people. It's about that connection you get when you just walk down the street with somebody. Uh, it's being in community, with talking with people, sharing, being around people. Um, and it's that emotional connection you get by connecting to another person. You know, and this, this uh, scene here could have taken place a thousand years ago, could be uh, 200 years in the future. The details change, but the essence still holds. And that emotional connection is a really rich part of life that VR has a great opportunity to capture. Um, characters are important for VR because um, they're the core of mainstream entertainment. That's what we love in our films, in our games, our, our TV shows, our books. And the you know, putting characters in experience helps to go to the main, mainstream audiences much quicker and something that they, they know and love and enjoy. And characters and people, um, digital or real, are that emotional, bringing that emotional connection that we love in real life and that we really engage with, with our entertainment. It's what connects us to our art. On top of that, people are how we interact with the world. Um, that's how we engage in real life. We construct real life around people. You know, cities, towns, all of these things are built around people. And, and a lot of this cuts across technology. Um, and you know, the UI of real life is how we interact with people, how we engage with people. And it has nothing to do with whether we're engaging through screens or switches or knobs or telephones. It's about that connection with people. And so, as a result, characters in VR need to respond like real life people, because if they don't, it breaks that illusion. What do we need to make these characters feel believable? Voice recognition, because as you can tell, people, we talk a lot in real life, people like to talk. Uh, so a digital character needs to understand what you're saying. Head and hand gestures are also an important thing to understand. You know, a digital character in a video game or a film in VR needs to understand your nonverbal social cues. You know, what does pointing mean? What does head shaking and head nodding mean? Because um, all of those communicate, and the nonverbal ways of communication are really important to get that level of believability. Um, gaze direction is part of that, where you're looking, where you're not looking. You know, the need to know when you're not paying attention. Or notice that you're looking at a particular thing in the room and infer something about what you want or what you're thinking about, just like we do in real life. Uh, distance is also real impo really important. The conversation we're having right now would be very different if I was talking two inches away from your face. And so that, there's a level of, uh, of meaning that comes with how close we are to somebody and the things we do when we are close or not so close to them. 
Um, and then any other rich human input available in VR. A lot of that will come as the technology increases. And why don't we have it today? There's a few things that are missing. Uh, characters are too hard to build. They're freaking hard to build. And that limits a lot of opportunities. That's why most VR experiences don't involve uh, characters or people. Or if they do, it's very minimal. Uh, character software is terrible and non-standard. It hasn't advanced for 15 years. And it wasn't really great 15 years ago. And because it's so non-standard, it's very hard for us to share characters and animation from one person to the other, from one studio to the other. And the expertise is very hard to find, very siloed and very um, you know, in studios using proprietary technology much of the time. And the interactivity portion of this is really hard. So these problems are the ones that our t team at Limless were, were very excited to solve with our deep character expertise in both film and games. We wanted to solve these problems for VR in a way that made it really a really rich experience and push VR forward. So our first project, our, our first customer project on our platform is called Gary the Gull. And in this VR experience, uh, it's an interactive VR short film where you sit down and <laughs> Seagull lands in front of you and starts talking to you. And you can talk back, understands what you're saying. You become a part of his story just like he becomes a part of yours. Um, the customer for this project is called Motional, um, run by and directed by Mark Walsh, an ex-Pixar writer, director, and animation supervisor. Uh, he directed uh, the short film Parisaurus Rex, an uh, old friend of mine from Pixar. It was super fun to work with him again. Uh, in Gary the Gull, the character responds to your voice, your nonverbal gestures, your distance, gaze direction, and the choices you make affect how the story plays out. It premiered in GDC a few months ago with Un the Unreal VR Lounge. It was also with uh, AMD and, and Sony's press conferences, and we'll be launching on PSVR uh, all, as well as all their major headsets. So I'm going to show you a short little trailer. <laughs> Hi. Do you, uh, you like that abstract art, huh? I guess. Oh, not bad. Thanks. Very Picasso-esque. That is a thing, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just a talking bird. <laughs> Hello, Carla. How you doing, baby? <laughs> Take a hike, Gary. Got it. My man is must have washed out to sea. How are you? Name's Gary. Gary the Gull. What's your name? And as you can see, Gary was responding to what the narrator, who happens to be the director, was saying. And so the choices change how the story runs out. So we're excited to get that out to the world and get more people looking at it and, and have more, more feedback. So what's next? Uh, first, we want to involve the VR community, because this is a problem we're super excited about, but we can't do it alone. There are tons of great artistic and technical challenges that we want to get more people involved with and uh, you know, work together to build you know, interactive characters into the core of our uh, VR experiences. Uh, we are also building the next phase of the character in cloud platform in order to make it easier to build characters, share them, and, um, and animate with them. We're building a closed alpha right now with top studio customers to help them build their uh, interactive character experiences and start building out the whole ecosystem. Uh, we are expanding the team. We've, uh, we've closed a round of seed funding with a bunch of great VCs, angels, and top VR funds. So we're looking to hire senior and lead engineers in order to help us build out the platform faster. And we are looking to be more ambitious. We have a marquee customer that it has a really exciting project that we'll be actively involved with that we uh, will use to help push our platform as, as much as it can and probably a little more in order to really build m richer, more interactive experiences and to give, give people a chance to see the potential and then let them expand it even further themselves. Thank you very much. A lot of special thanks to just some of the key people who worked on Gary the Gull. Um, thanks for your time. Um, but feel free to grab me afterwards if you have questions, and I'll take a few questions from the audience. Hi, thanks. Is he learning from all of the interactions he has with people? Is he getting smarter? Not yet. Uh, right Is now, he going to get smarter? Down the road, we will be building more of that, that's, that's self-learning, self-aware. 
Uh, right now, because everybody knows how to build uh, stories that are that are you know, that have beginning, middle, ends, are very narrative driven, they're very director driven. We're building systems to let you build those out uh, quicker, easier, and better, and make them very compelling in VR. And then we'll layer on other more advanced AI tech on top of that for things like memory learning. Um, we have some support for that now in a very rudimentary level, uh, but the, the future is when we're going to expand that out. Uh, we think that AI is a great, um, a great uh, complement. We don't necessarily need to solve the full AI problem ourselves. We have some ideas for how that's going to work. We definitely know what the API should be to plug AI into characters. Um, we'll do some work on that end. We definitely want to be partnering with other AI companies to, uh, to you know, let their platform um, work with ours. And that's a key part of, of what we want to do as we engage the VR community. We don't b believe that we don't want to be building closed platform where all the solutions are ours. We want to build an open platform where everybody can be plugging in their technology and their characters through APIs into our platform, take advantage of what we provide, and then leverage it to all the characters available on the platform. One of the challenges with lifelike interaction is interactional synchrony. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you're dealing with that and with the uh, latency problem of going over the internet over. When you say synchrony, what do you mean exactly? Uh, there's a nonverbal dance that happens at a very high rate between people who are in rapport with each other. Mm -hmm. There's an actual physically observable synchrony. If you take high speed film and slow it down, one person's eye blink corresponds with another person's twitch. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the slapping of the vocal cords together synchronizes with a person's brain waves. Most of that is down the road R&D that we're not tackling yet. But we believe that by tackling um, a, a more art-directed set of problems, we can get to believability quicker. That doesn't mean realism. You know, we don't need to hit realism now. Maybe we never want to. That's actually an open question of how realistic these particular characters need to be. But we can hit believability with, by uh, getting creatives involved and working with, um, with technical people in order to create something that's believable and art directable. Um, and that creates believability. And then we can layer on additional things that we need to get it to the next level. So yeah, that's well, a good question. Uh, you know, we don't have all of these problems solved already. Uh, we want to lay a foundation that everybody can start experimenting on, ourselves included, but other people as well, to start figuring out these problems and figure out what the right problems, um, what, what, the, what the right problems to solve are. Because maybe once we're 30% down the road, you might realize the next 70% is not what we expected at the beginning. It's not open source, but it is. Um, we do uh, want to work with people, so we're you know, making it available to people to work with and build their own projects on. And then we will be opening up APIs you know, more publicly uh, down the road. We're keeping the group of people working uh, with our tech small right now because we want to give a lot of personal attention, you know, which is why we're calling a closed alpha. But uh, we're not trying to be elitist or exclusive. We're just trying to keep that group small enough that we can give them personal attention, let them use it, and then based on that feedback, figure out how much we, you know, how the APIs look and, uh, and then how to expose them. Can you talk about the, the process of writing for one of these characters? Do you have dialogue trees? How does the player know what available things they can say? The writing Cause... part, that is a, a, good converse, a good question and probably a little more time than we have now. Happy to talk to you afterwards. The short answer is we are using a lot of uh, third-party tools for that, uh, Twine being the, big, the main one, in order to help you construct branching narratives. The way that Mark designed this story is that it doesn't really branch that much. Uh, similar to a Telltale game, the narrative is fixed, but you can have a different emotional experience based on your decisions. And so the branching uh, part of it ended up being pretty simple. We did a couple little things that we, um, you, to make that a little easier to, to test and prototype. Um, but largely, the narrative ended up being fixed, which made it, would make the problem a little bit easier. Uh, down the road, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting work that we'll be working with other uh, customers on, on how to construct branching narratives and uh, how, to, how to prune trees um, a little more aggressively than we typically do in video games so that we can scale better. So, yeah. Happy to talk to you more, more afterwards if you'd like. Tom, do, do, you know, as you evolve the platform, do you see a, 
a model that you have uh, sort of boundary conditions and then have general maybe fabric of the story and you create X characters or adaptive and autonomous and have them sort of played out in an un uncertain outcome? Um, I, think, I think there's a big possibility for that. The big question I have is how much people want that. Like, do we want to be building stories where I say, you know, that person's grumpy and he doesn't like chickens. And that other person really loves chickens and is happy. And we put them in a room together and see what happens. We might want to build those stories. Uh, and, and I want to be, and, you know, we're talking with AI companies now. We're going to continue to be talking with AI companies about what that means and how you do it. Um, but it's an open question to me how much you want the fully autonomous, you know, I'm just an entirely um, self-aware person for entertainment and for a lot of the, the verticals like education and, and, um, uh, education and um, training that will come down the road. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, want to build a platform that is open to that and that we can support that as plugins and then everything else can support it on the aesthetic and the technical level and then see, see what happens. But I certainly believe that while that end goal may or may not be what we want as storytellers, we will want some things in the middle where we have emotional states on characters, where we, they, they learn or change based on our decisions. And that's part of our platform plans in the future that, again, will be driven by customers on the timing, but we think there's going to be a lot of potential there. We are talking with some people, uh, and I can talk to you more afterwards uh, about about you know like different different possibilities. We are talking to some people about um, you know building these kind of experience in a more social way. Um, you know the the multiplayer um, portion of it is not our core expertise, so we're not trying to tackle that. We want to work with people that are tackling multiplayer and more um, you know more ambient encounters with with characters. And you know, and partner with them because it is a really cool. It'd be a cool cameo, you know. Like yes, you could just exactly. show up and just yeah. And we've yeah. talked about that. And I think it'd be really fun. And you know, being able to experience the same, you know, being uh, interactive short film together, and you know, possibly make choices together. I think could be really interesting. You know, you and I are both sitting on the beach and we're talking to Gary, and he has to decide who's to listen to, and we have like a little multiplayer dialogue. It could be super fun, and that would be a great thing in the not so distant future. Uh, so I'm curious that uh, has there been any um, efforts in integrating this into, say, AI captured human uh, figures in VR, integrating the interactive to a piece into that? Do you mean like mocap humans, like re fully realistic humans? Yeah. Is that what you mean? You know, AI technology. Um, yeah, yeah, we are talking with some companies about about the that both on the AI end and on the like. Photo real humans. I want to use like, photo real is not the right word. You know, like, realistic humans. Um, yeah, we're talking to some people uh, on that end. So more needs to come. From the developer perspective, what's the experience? How much do you need to know about the characters so you can create the attributes that can then you know, autonomously interact in the environment? Yeah. It's designed to be really simple. So you, we we boil it down to the essence of what a story is. And here, the story is about animation and dialogue, like things that he's saying and doing, and the decisions. So each of those show up as nodes in a graph. And then you create your, you know, you put your animation nodes here where he's talking and animating, you know, you, um, you know in one, you, you set that up as one node, tie them together, and then you connect those to decisions. And those decisions have a variety of different um, options for how you can interact with it. You can you know, say, well, when he says these words or these phrases or these type of responses, you know, we have some natural language processing support, then you know, these outcomes should happen. Or these gestures or uh, you know, have this happen in these situations. So you can configure what that decision means and the kinds of input you're expecting. Uh, we have some uh, actions that happen outside of that graph, like interruptions. You know, if you toss something on Gary and it hits him, you know, you probably want him to react, but you don't want to feed that into your main story. So we have those, those are separate nodes where, you know, when interruptions happen, here are the type of interruptions that are supported, and this is how the, how the story should progress. Uh, but we designed it to be simple. You know, you can put the whole Gary the Girl story into, I think, two dozen nodes, maybe less by now. And they're all fundamental nodes to that experience. And then as we work with more customers, we'll get feedback on how much of that is useful, how much of it isn't, and then um, progress to look at all the, the pain points in building that experience and try to make those easier. So I think we're out of time, but I'm happy to talk more afterwards. Thank you very much.